Welcome to King's Church 2024 edition. <laughs> Season five. Uh, <laughs> building big Christians who know the word of God, who know the spirit of God, and uh, they serve the house of God. And so that's about as simple as it gets. It seems to be rare these days, but it's about, that's about it. Can we do, can we commit to that? God, we know what we want to know your word. Do you know that, that for the history of man, we had basically the same kind of technology. And by that, I mean like we had wheels, you know, grinding wheels, wheels on carts. There wasn't a day where we had square wheels. We were just dragging stuff on square wheels. That didn't happen, right? We had kind of the wheel. We had some fire. We would cook things. We had some spears. We had that kind of stuff. And then 500 years ago, the proliferation of the scripture happened. And so from the history of the, you know, the origins of man to 1500, we had about the same technology and society, feudal systems, agrarian systems, traveling nomadic peoples. That was it for the whole world. The word of God proliferates in, 15, in, the, in the 16th century through the Gutenberg press, and in 500 years, we go to the moon. I mean, we, we couldn't go 20 miles. Like, if you went 20 miles in your life, that's pro level. You're like, I want to travel. <laughs> 20 miles, that's what you get. If you're one of those kids, back in the day, you really wanted to travel. It just meant you wanted to go 20 miles away. The proliferation of God's word is a phenomenal revolution that happened to mankind. It sparked the enlightenment, and within 500 years, we didn't just have wheels. We were taking rocket ships to the moon. The word of God is what liberates us. It, it's what frees us, and it's beautiful. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, all right, so spirit of God, that's important too. House of God. House of God's important too, amen? amen? Hey, listen, I'm reading this book right now. It's called Not All the Same Size or something like that. It's about churches and church dynamics and church growth, all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's categorizes churches by class, small church, medium church, large church. Small church is about 35 people, and then it gets up to 75 people. And 50% and of the churches in America are about that about that amount of people, whether you know that or not. And in that kind of per group, you can kind of know everybody's name. 35 people, you can know everybody's name, you get to know everybody, that's how that works. That's called human group dynamics, right? Uh, as soon as you cross that 75 boundary and you get to 200 or 500, you can't know everybody. That's impossible. Do you understand that? I, I don't know if I knew this as a young person, so, you know, I would want to, I would, you know, be a part of the church, and I'm like, well, why don't I know everybody? Well, because you can't. <laughs> this is how, let's look at the G Jesus concentric circles of relationship. And Sincere, I think you encouraged me to share this to the church. Jesus had three people that were very close to him, Peter, James, and John. Those were his homies. That was the closest core guys. Uh, you, anybody else have three people that are really close to you? They're on your text threads. You, you send them the stuff you shouldn't on <laughs> Instagram. Like your three core people, right? And then the next circle of, of relationship is 12. That's the next circle. So three, easy. You can be in daily contact with them. Then it go, moves to 12. You can't be in daily contact with 12 people. Not people you like anyway. I mean, people you work with, you can. You don't really like them. But regular 12 people that you like and do life with, it's very hard to keep up with 12 relationships at a time. But that's your second level. And you can keep that group of relationships. And then it goes to this in Jesus' life. Then it's the 70. You remember the 70? The 70 are the next group. They're the ones that get to interact with Jesus. They get to know him. Beyond that, it goes 120. And then it really goes to multitudes because you cannot know more than about 120 people. If you do the research, you understand how social systems work, that's about it. And so our church is not 35 people, correct? It's more than that. <laughs> So when you come in here, in order for you to build relationship, you have to find a small group to hang out with, okay? Whether that's the worship team or Derek and the production sound team or the Jeffrey Alley, Stephanie, 
soon to be Nolt, uh, <laughs> Bible study team, right? There are subgroups inside of a church like ours. And if you say to yourself, man, it sure feels like it it's, can be really clicky. I just want you to understand the only churches that do not naturally and sociologically develop natural subgroups are churches below 75 people. Those are the only ones you can possibly know everybody. It's impossible to do anything else. And so the word clicky is a way to say, well, and I heard, I heard some chatter this week about somebody saying our church is clicky. And I'm like, our church has subgroups because it's impossible to know 200 people, which is about our attendance, right? It's literally impossible to know all those people. I certainly don't know everybody's name. You know that. <laughs> it's just, I can't do that. I don't have the capacity. It's one of my weaknesses. Where's Diana? Diana, where are you? There's Diana right in the back. I've known Diana for years now. We were here filming something and I was try introducing someone to a group of us and I was like, and here's a lady. <laughs> it's not because I'm evil, right? It's because that's how human beings interact one to another. So we're starting small groups. Ah, small group pitch. I use sociology to do a small group pitch. Small groups. That's how you build relationships. That's how you build your circle. And it's not going to be like every single person is going to be your best friend because you joined us. But that's how you discover who your people will be. You know, Matthew 18 is a corrective verse. It talks about church excommunication. Uh, and we're going to actually talk about that issue today in a members-only meeting after church. At the end of second service, it's only for members. You're not allowed to come if you're not a member of King's Church because it's private, and I care about my church, and I'm protective of my church, okay? And so you're a member if you've taken membership course, and if you regularly attend, give, and serve. No, not serve. Attend, give. Oh, believe in our, our, our statement of beliefs. Those are the three things. Obviously, we take membership very seriously. <laughs> I can't remember what they are. No. Um, Matthew chapter 18, there's this pattern of how to excommunicate somebody, essentially. And at the end, it says, and once that happens, they've gone all the way through the system, and you've, you've disciplined that person. It says, now, once that's happened, treat them like a taxpayer or a publican, which is another term for wicked, evil, deceptive, worst person kind of you don't hang out with. You don't make that person your friend. Uh, in, when people get newly saved, they, they don't know how to do this. And when people come to Christ, especially through attractional church models, not that ours is that, uh, they don't know how to do this. Christians are not supposed to live their life with the closest people in their life being unsaved people. This is not a subject of debate. I don't care if you went to preschool with this person. And, and swap diapers as a kid. I don't care. Christians are not supposed to have best friends with non-Christians. That's not supposed to be it. You are, on the other hand, supposed to live in the world and be among the people of the world and love the people of the world and reach out to the people of the world. Amen? But that's not your identity. You have a brand new identity in Christ, and your people need to be people of the faith. Amen? Amen. Pastor, wow, I didn't know it was going to be this good, but beginning of the year, you're hitting hard. Amen. Wow, really, wow. Okay, first, let's jump into this. You ready? Okay, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing what you had heard? And we know what Galatians is about because you've been with me as we've been walking through this, and it's about these Judaizers that snuck into this brand new community of believers and said, you're not really real Christians, you're not really saved, you're not really sons and daughters of God, but if you circumcise your kids and if you follow these dietary laws and if you never have a beer and if you whatever, then you will really be of the people of God. But because you don't you know, read your Bible every single morning and haven't read through the Bible in a year program, you're not the real deal. Like they're putting systems on the people of God. We have that, right? Every once in a while, uh, if you were to take a ladder, a very tall seven-story ladder and climb up into my windows at night in the wee hours in the late where only the goblins are out you will find me and I will be sitting at the television uh, and the flickering of the screen will be at my face and I will be playing a game called Fortnite and I will be battling 11 year old children and they will be cursing at me 
and it will be wonderful. It will cause me great joy when 11-year-old children curse at me. It will bring life to my heart. <laughs> then I emote on them. Is that it? Is that the emote? That was it? That was it. Great. Yes? Great. Perfect. <laughs> um, I like video games, uh, so sue me. Um, I like doing young things. I like to stay, I wanna be young. I wanna be an old young guy, you know what I mean? I don't wanna get crotchety and only do Sudoku. <laughs> you know, I wanna, I wanna stay young. Um, when, when, we were, when we first brought the, the scourge of video games into our home, uh, I would remember when we were first, when, we, when the kids were little, I was like, we'll never have video games. The kids will only read Aristotle and smoke pipes. You know, it's like, <laughs> and then you get older and you do away with those ideals. And when we brought the video games into our home, I remember Leon was like, I'm a gamer, dad, I'm a gamer. He always used to say, I'm a gamer. And it was so funny because it reminded me, at, especially at that age, he had never said, I'm a, and then whatever the label is. Like, that's who I am. That's where I find my people, my tribe, my identity. And I find this identity struggle happening right here in the book of Galatians. And guess what I discovered? The word Galatian or Galatia, the etymology of that word is foreigner or stranger. And so these people that have this almost kind of fundamental problem with feeling like a foreigner or stranger, confused about their identities, the Judaizers come in and say, you're not really a part of the body of Christ. You're not really sons and daughters of God. Your identity will only be affirmed by these additional layers that we stack on you. Other than that, I don't know who you are. And I find that New York City, more than any place I've lived in my entire life, I find people that struggle with identity. Yeah. And if you struggle with identity personally, that means you struggle with identity before the Lord, and that means you struggle with your salvation. Am I even saved? Is this even real, God? What's happening here? And because this crack is in the armor of the Galatian people, the Judaizers can walk in and say, I will give you an identity. I'll tell you who you are. I'll stamp my identity upon you. And the devil would love to stamp his identity on you and confuse you about who you are in Christ Jesus. And this is this, uh, you know, revolutionary offer that God makes to mankind that Jesus reveals God as father and that he would be your father and your identity could be found in him. The world has never even considered something like that. What does it mean that you're a son of God? Like God? Do you know how royalty works? If you're the son of a king, right, you get a special title, right? And then you have powers of king under that kingship. Now, imagine that you're a prince or a princess just for the sake of this, you know, conversation. And that's like real. I'm a prince or a princess of a nation. That's very cool. Everybody's like, wow, that's phenomenal. And there's a giant kingdom behind me. But what if that was actually real? But instead of a monarchy, instead of a magisterium, it was God himself who was on the top. And you are one of his sons or daughters. And then... Imagine what the devil would want to do to that. He'd want to tear your identity from you because it would make you weak and impotent and confused and insecure, questioning whether God loves you or not, questioning your salvation at all times. And that's what's happening here in the book of Galatians. Verse 3, are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? I am, like you, probably trying to get back in the gym beginning of the year. It's an important time of year to get in there, and everybody's in there. And because of Stephen Prowse, how many people know have met Stephen Prowse when he was here for the summer? Stephen Prowse, very large tank-level man, and he actually got me into the gym this summer, and he's, I don't know what he's doing in there. He's doing all kinds of weird stuff. He's running around to weird machines, doing weird things. He just pick up a machine a few times <laughs> and put it down. Like, that's his whole workout, and you can, you can do it. 
But you go in there right now, this time of year, it's just packed. You can't find a spot. And I'm already insecure about working out. Everybody looks great. They're all in shape. And I'm kind of like flowing everywhere in my workout clothes. And I, you know, I'm like, I'm pushing the bar, just the bar alone up, you know? You just feel like a doofus. That's a lie. I, I'm, I put on more than that. Um, there's a sense of insecurity about the gym, but you know, the thing about the gym is there's mirrors everywhere. Does your gym have mirrors everywhere? Like a very, like, it's not just like a mirror just to check, it's mirror walls. And when Bethany and I are at the gym together walking or on the treadmill, sometimes we watch people, there's a giant mirror wall, and everybody that walks in, they just stare at themselves in the mirror the whole time. It's like, do you not know there are other people looking at you right now being that vain? Like, I get we're vain, we're all here, but you're, like, do you, you don't, yeah. <laughs> There's a vanity about gym life. Now, obviously, be healthy, right? Don't die of a heart attack. Work out. It's good for you. Make you feel good. It's, it's, it's actually, I think very important to do, but there's a, there's a vanity side of it, clearly, we all know that. I mean, we don't need to spend too much time on it. What is vanity? A vanity is that the outside parts of you would be more important than the inside parts of you. The vain things are the passing things, the things of not much substance, the things of not deep resolve, the things that are not related to identity. I have three children. None of them look the same. And there's nothing that they can do to stop being Engelharts. They could even go to the DMV, God forbid, and change their name. God forbid the DMV not change their name. Like, uh, they're still, every ounce of their cell declares that they are of me and my wife. Every cell in their body screams that they are Engelhart. What does that mean? That means love God with all your life, be a little bit irreverent. <laughs> be a little bit of a disaster, and then love God with all your life again. That's what that means. <laughs> they can't help but be an Engelhart. It's their very DNA. It's written into the code. It's not something on the surface. You know, I was joking with Derek. His, uh, he's, got a, he's got a turtleneck on, and he's getting married to Maggie. And I was like, you, you, you become a part of the family. You start dressing the same. We're both wearing <laughs> turtlenecks this morning. But the truth is, you can, you can dress like me, but it doesn't make you a part of my family. You can dress like Leon. I was, on the, I was in the elevator with Leon and I said to him, how does it, what does it feel like coming from the 90s? Because, you know, if you're from the 90s, that's how 90s kids dressed. And he, he said it felt great. I was happy about that. Uh, it doesn't matter what you look like on the outside. Identity comes from the inside. And Paul says this phrase, and it's specific it's related to identity. It's related to who they are in Christ. Let's read it again. Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit that you're now trying to be finished by means of the flesh, the outward stuff, this, how you, what you look like on the outside? Have you experienced so much in vain? Were all of those experiences in God just about your appearance? just about your acceptance before men and not before God? Was there a substantial change on the inside of you that happened when you came to God or was all just something that you put on? Which one was it? Because Paul's like, you're just putting on a new outfit right now. And it's not ultimately substantively going to change your heart or your life. Amen. Verse 5. So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And so here's this key element inside of this whole book of Galatians. I would say if there's a master key inside of the book of Galatians, this word is the master key and it is the word spirit. That is what Paul is trying to contrast. You, obviously circumcision shows the, the big garish contrast. Works of the flesh versus this one word, the spirit. And here, 
Abraham, this is the story. It's the first story. You know the song? You remember the song? Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them. Hey, so are you. So let's go. Right arm. <laughs> uh, right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot, because he's walking, he's following God, right? That's the whole, that's the picture. You, you manipulate your children's brain into believing. And the Lord said, uh, so again, I ask you, does God give you his spirit? Again, this is the key. And work miracles among you by works of the law or by believing what you heard. So also Abraham believed. Let's just call him Father Abraham for the sake of fun. Father Abraham. Bah, 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 bah. It should be horns, right? It should be trumpets, I think. A trumpet section in that song for sure. Ape Father Abraham. Great song. Classic. Father Abraham. Father. Why is this character so important when we're talking about identity? Because fathers produce sons and daughters with mothers. That's why Paul goes to a father, Father Abraham, when he's talking about people confused in their identities. Father. You know what fathers are supposed to do? One of their primary roles is to name things. Now, I'm, I'm sure, sure you can name together. I'm not saying you're not naming together. Um, the very first task of man before every other task, before being fruitful and multiplying, before subduing the garden, the very first task of mankind is to name things, is to give identities to things. And when father is gone, Identity often is gone with it. And in a fatherless generation, the people feel like strangers and foreigners. They don't know where to belong. And they don't know who they are. It says in Genesis that God brought all the animals to Adam. Bob Dylan's got a great song about him. God gave man gave name to all the animals. In the beginning, it's a great song. We need to do it at church. <laughs> Adam names the animals. It shows that part of the task of, of mankind is to subsidiarily give identity to those that are underneath you, to tell them that they belong, to tell them who they are. The Judaizers do the opposite, and it shows they're of the stock of hell. They come in and say, you don't belong to God unless you do these things. So in a culture where there's no fathers, in a, in a fatherless culture that's seeking identity to know who they are and to be named, is it a wonder that we're confused about our gender? About who we even are, whether we're boys or girls? Is, is that, like, did we not see that coming? I was watching a horrific uh, Instagram video this week, and the mom tells a story about her little daughter, and the daughter comes to her and says, Mom, am I, a, am I a boy or a girl? And the mom says, I don't know who you are. With the biggest smile and the most fun laughter, isn't that so full of joy and fun? What a great time telling your kid, I don't know what you are. You're saying who, but what you mean is, I don't even know what you are. And identity is destroyed and lost and crashed upon the rocks of secularism. And then we're like, well, we better legislate against transgender. And can I say we better? Can we say, yes, we better? We better legislate against kids chopping their body up. And yes, we better, but we're dealing with the fruit and not the root. We're dealing with the fruit and not the roots of the tree. The roots of the tree are families that have rejected God and his order. Society that's rejected God and his order and has abandoned family and father and order and structure and name itself. Name itself. Verse 7. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Here, just to remember, this is... 
The scripture is so brilliant, I think it calls the Bible etymologically cognate. That means every word and every syllable and every piece of meaning is woven together. So there's no accidents in each of these scriptures. We're talking about identity. And then he says, I understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. What does that mean? That more children would come to be the seed in the stock of Abraham and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. He said this, all nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. How did Abraham become the father of faith? Was it through doing? Was it through the law? No. Abraham's relationship with God existed before the law was ever written. Now, certainly there's a moral law on the hearts of men. I'm not referring to that. I'm talking about the codified law that God gave to Moses. His relationship had nothing to do with that law. So Paul's like, what are you, what are you doing? Go back to first principles. And the very first principle is that the Spirit of God would do something. He would speak to you. He would awaken you. He would call to your heart. And that's what the whole thing is. I, I never feel more like a son of God than when I'm walking in the Spirit of God. I never feel, I never worry about, am I going to hell? Am I going to heaven? And I worry about that sometimes, especially in New York when I have to deal with cab drivers and, and whoever. Uh, delivery boys almost running me over, you know? It's like, I almost killed them, Lord. Am I still saved? I don't know. When I'm walking in the Spirit of God, I don't wonder about those things. When I'm filled with the Spirit of God, when I can feel my life a part of the clockwork design of God's plan and destiny, I do not wonder about my identity. Verse 8. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. I just said that, and I said it with emphasis, and I'm moving to the next verse. Um, Verse 9, so then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And this, uh, obviously the, the polemic will continue here, but this last phrase is that they're blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith, is saying that you are of the nation of Abraham and that you are of the class of Abraham. You are not a second-class citizen. You don't need to be stamped by the Judaizers. You don't need to be okayed by a third party. You are of that class of Abraham that the Spirit of God called to you and you responded. And so the Judaizers want to put on stacks and stacks of duties. We're coming into a new year right now. We're all saying it's going to be a better me. It's a better year. I'm going to start doing all of these things. And I'm going to really, you know, get my Bible reading down. And you should. And I'm really going to work out. And you should. But that doesn't affect your identity in Christ. Right. Hopefully it supports it, Right. If I'm working out, I'm less likely to get depressed. If I'm working out, right, whatever. Hopefully it supports my life, but it doesn't create my life in Christ. The Spirit of God does that. And so there's two things, and we're, worship team, you can come up. We're gonna, I mean, I'm going to close with this. And this is, such a, this is the, the clearest picture of the gospel. Abraham believes, justified, and then he responds, acts. And it's like, you know, we have all this kind of like, well, you don't have to do anything Christianity that's out there. I just believe. No, 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 no. Abraham believes, he's justified, and he acts, he follows. Not in perfection, but in faithfulness. Because, you know, the proverb says the righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up. And that's why Father Abraham, right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot, is the most fundamental picture of what it is to follow God. To respond to the Spirit of God and then act and then walk after Him, pursue Him. Sometimes we get busy in, in this life and we do a lot of walking and it's our own kind of walking and it's walking for our own pleasure or our own sin or just our own plans and that's not the story of Abraham 
God says, leave your father and your home and your security and your stability. We're talking about a time with wandering bands of nomads and warriors that will kill you. Leave it all and follow me. And as soon as he says yes to God, he becomes justified and he becomes brought into this wild, incredible adventure. But the second thing he has to do is he has to actually leave. Amen? He has to actually follow. He's already immediately been turned into the sun by the, this incredible internal supernatural work. My kids can't not be my kids. But they can behave unlike my kids. They can behave unlike Engelhart's. And God's calling us this year to walk in accordance with his spirit that we would know and respond, but that we would also follow in obedience. Amen, church. Why don't you stand up with me?